Wendy has got her Bible open so you know things are going to get real. We're about to get to the Word eventually. Cool. Just um, we, We've just got some really profound questions that we'd love to ask you guys now, some really deep ones that just the, the people have sent in, they've been asking. So Wendy, if we can start with you very quickly. Uh, you've got one meal to eat for the rest of your life. What do you go with? Steak and red wine, eh? Yeah, a good red wine and a steak, probably. Mm. I love fish as well. Mm. Nice. Good, good, good. Just, uh, I think you've won a whole bunch of those people there. They weren't listening before, but now they're steak and red wine. And, uh, and Terry, just some really a deep question. Cricket, rugby, soccer, you choose one. Which one? Soccer, probably. <laughs> And, and obviously, I know that you, are, you mentioned Brighton, so Bright, you, you're a Brighton fan. But as I chat to you, you seem like a godly man who loves community, who loves saying, actually, we never walk alone. So are you a closet Liverpool fan? That's what people are wanting to know. No, I, I enjoy watching very good football. And so... There <laughs> <laughs> Trying to... So back... Back in the 80s, I was a Liverpool fan, and, uh, and then I probably became a Man United fan when, <laughs> when Ferguson was leading. I like watching good football, and I, so I don't actually, I love watching Spurs now, so, when I, so uh, I mean, Brighton's my hometown, so, I mean, they're scraping their way through the Premier. Uh, Terry, um, do not, the Apostle Paul would say, who has bewitched you? <laughs> That's all Gabriel's jokes. So um, <laughs> now I have to speak. <laughs> it's, it's all of them right there in about three minutes. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. Maybe just before we jump onto maybe a different track, and uh, we're going to hear, we're so excited for the weekend and to hear so much more about the gospel of grace. And, and really, that's why I've asked you to speak on that subject because I think you're one of the voices this world has had and, and a premier voices to speak into that area. But the church and where you see the church now, you've loved the church, you've sacrificed the church, and maybe for both of you, Wendy as well, you've sown, you've planted, you've pioneered, um, 79 years old and still traveling and still staying in people's homes and using cars, and it sounds glamorous, but it's not glamorous, and um, just thank you for that, but you obviously love the church, so as you look forward now and the reality of the church now and looking forward, what do you think are some of the challenges that we're going to face, are facing, and some of the fights that are worth fighting for in terms of the future of the church. I think that being culturally relevant, <laughs> I, I, th I, I think that being uh, culturally relevant is beginning to be uh, a word that's often used now. And I think that's fine. Uh, my only fear is when that gets slightly driven uh, to the extent that we begin to reflect the culture rather than uh, impact the culture. And I think that's just a slight, in recent, very recent years, a slight drift there. Uh, I think when we first started, it, the pioneering kind of church life that we were bringing was so radically different uh, that uh, it needed, needed, we needed that. Uh, there's a sense in which we were involved in reformation, the restoration of biblical church life. And it was like a reformation. And we needed to get the church sorted. And it probably made us a little bit introspective for a season. And that would be true church. If you think of uh, church history, uh, the reformation, Luther, Calvin, and so on, it, it was a time for sorting the church, uh, issues of salvation. And then you needed uh, Carey to come along and remind the church, we're on world mission. What about the people? And of course, when he first started going and wanted to go to India, uh, some pretty extreme Calvinists said to him, sit down, Mr. Carey. If God wants to save the Indians, he'll do it. You know? And they, uh, he had to really fight for a recovery of being on a mission. And I think we needed to uh, be reminded of being on a mission because we were so 
a committee, let's get the church sorted. The church has become, I'm like Nehemiah said, the walls are down, the, 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 the doors are burned. We've got to get this city up again. Let it, it's, the church is supposed to be glorious, and it wasn't. It was a pain. And, and now, to be honest, the church has become so much more exciting and wonderful. I know it's not perfect, but there's a lot that's so exciting. And, and we needed to rediscover getting on a mission. And that's great. And so church planting, being on a mission. And I think part of that is being sure that you're culturally relevant, that you know how to address your culture. You know how to speak to people so they can hear you. And, and wonderful people like Tim Keller. I mean, tremendous, helpful people help us to uh, address the culture. He spoke in London recently at the Westminster at our uh, government breakfast. I mean, absolutely stunning, brilliant, brilliant. But sometimes you hear people um, wanting to uh, win the culture by becoming a bit more like the culture. And I think that's the challenge that still faces us, uh, that we want to be relevant, but we don't want to be... Uh, I mean, Os Guinness wrote a tremendous book about the danger of relevance that in the end robs you of relevance because you're just trying to imitate the culture. And I think Os Guinness put his finger on something quite important there. So I think that's a real challenge. That's, we want to stay biblical and uh, bring people to God. And that's the, that's the most relevant thing you can do. So I think that's one of the challenges that faces us, that that edge gets, gets blurred. We want to, this is our message. You can step out of death into life. And I think also making room for the manifestation of the presence of God. Uh, I think sometimes now uh, meetings have got larger and larger. Uh, very often churches have grown. And so the manifestation of the Spirit in spiritual gifts in terms of percentage-wise of uh, that being manifest can become smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think we don't want to see that rediscovery of spiritual gifts be gradually becoming forgotten because well, in the big meeting, there's not really much space for that anymore. Well, you know, some years ago, we were so excited to rediscover these things. Uh, and now the danger of them becoming more and more minimalized. And I feel probably the thing we really need to do is work hard on discipling so that in our small group life, which more uh, reflects... Uh, yeah, the Excited small, about small group the, life. Uh, if you look at New Testament um, church life, many of those were house churches, and the context is a smaller context. So we, may, we have small meetings. We need to probably train and teach and encourage so that in those smaller meetings, there's much more manifestation of the presence of the Spirit. And when we get gather in our many hundreds, we still want the presence of God, yes. But the number of times you're going to get spiritual gifts, is, is, that's going to be affected. You can't, you can't escape that. Uh, I'm, I met a guy called Eddie Leo, if I may just use this illustration. He's got a big church of 27,000 in Jakarta, Indonesia. Well, Indonesia is the biggest Muslim nation in the world. And uh, I said to him about your church buildings, he said, we don't have church buildings. The Muslims would burn them down. Uh, so he said, we meet in congregations all over Jakarta, 5,000 here, 2,000 here, 3,000 there. And I said, what about spiritual gifts? He said, well, that, you know, 5,000, you, you know, it's not going to happen much. But I said, I understood that you believe in spiritual gifts. He said, oh, we do. He said, we've seen nine raised from the dead. So I thought, well, that's impressive. And uh, I said, but where, where, where does the manifestation of the Spirit? He said, oh, it's all in our small groups. All in, I said, but none of our small groups are not quite mature enough to handle that. And he said, oh, well, we believe in all the Ephesians 4 ministries. So I said, well, so do we. So he said, we, we gather our small group leaders, and we would ask them, is your small group very evangelistic? And, it, and if the small group leader was saying, well, ours, ours isn't, they would take them out of the system, as it were, uh, and say to the small group leaders, right, you go now with our evangelists for six or eight weeks, and he will teach and train on evangelism. And then when he taught and trained the people on evangelism, then they put them back in, and, s and then we'll see you in six months. And now, is your small group more evangelistic now? Ha has it changed? I thought, wow. 
And then he said, is your small group very charismatic? Is it experiencing spiritual gifts? And if people said, no, ours isn't, you pull those out, put them with the prophet. And the prophet would take those small groups uh, for a, another, what, six, eight, ten weeks, teach into it, teach into it, then put them back in the system. Are you more charismatic now? Yeah. God's, so he said, we, we are instructing our groups so that the small groups are very vibrant, evangelistically, charismatically. He said, in the big meeting, the 5,000 and so on, you're not going to get a lot of that because, well, it's 5,000 people. And so I, I felt, wow, that's the most challenging I've heard. And I think, I know, we need to address that so that our small groups are more alive in the spirit, alive evangelistically. Yeah. Uh, and then the big meeting, yeah, there are obviously going to be limitations on the manifestation of spiritual gifts. Maybe just in terms of that, obviously there'll be limitations. How do you see that? I'm, I'm intrigued uh, as I've had the privilege of traveling, ministering. Uh, Terry and I had, the, I had the privilege of being in a church in Qatar recently, which is, intrigues me. It's, it's possibly the worst church building around, like the worst, and yet the life of God is so evident, and, and there's the power of God evident in that community Explain that a little bit around the, the move of the Spirit and, and how you see that for churches yeah, it's today. A, it's a great church, so although they may be like just short of 2,000 people, yeah. but they meet in three different meetings, four now, four meetings. So it's a few hundred each time in a very intimate, it's a house, yeah. a villa. And, you know, I'm amazed. It's a phenomenal place. So there's people over there, and there's people back there, and there's people around there, and they keep extending and pushing it back and filling it with people. And, and it is very, very buoyant. And the gifts of the Spirit are manifest there. I think they've retained that in that context. It's got an intimacy, although you add it all up, it comes to 2,000. The meeting you attend may be like 500. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's, they've retained an intimacy uh, within the 500. I think it, it takes gifted leadership and, and being on a journey together. So when we started growing and right, the church in Brighton I was at for 30 years, when we, we, we had about 450 in our main meeting when we grew and then we planted out and planted out. We were still enjoying spiritual gifts. We, we, we kept going with it. But I've noticed now, you know, I travel widely as I know you do, and, and you do find now that very often the big meeting, I mean, the worship's wonderful, or sometimes it's not, but often it is. Um, but you don't necessarily encounter supernatural gifts in that meeting. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And I think that for myself, remembering the battle it was at the beginning to rediscover these things and to fight for them and all the backlash and all the pain and winning winning hearts and, and say, look, it's in the Bible, and this is wonderful when God speaks. Um, it's a bit sad to see it drifting away, because it is in some places, because you know how wonderful it was and how hard it was to recover it. So I was very blessed when I heard Eddie say, oh, no, we've got it. We're absolutely full of it. We're seeing more and more. But it's in the small groups. That's where it's, we're making sure it's happening. So I felt he was the more developed than anybody I'd encountered in that. Just um, a question, uh, maybe Wendy, you can kick us off with it, but uh, it's, uh, I think overlooking at your ministry, um, for many years, there's, there's no real big scandal that's uh, popped up, unless you want to confess something. Um, <laughs> but no, but just I think the, 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 what, what has been the thing that has sustained you guys? What, why, why, why is that such a, I think it's a phenomenal thing that God has been so gracious, so mm. kind. Mm. And I know I'm not saying there's no imperf uh, perf imperfections and weaknesses, but what's the, the thing that's driven you and, and, and held your marriage together in this expanding gospel? Mm. What, is, what has kept this thing, you would, what has kept your journey sweet? Yes, yes, I think... Right from the beginning, we've had a very high view of marriage. And um, I know I was very intentional on my wedding day to promise to love, honor, and obey, although even 50 years ago, I was challenged about that. Um, but I just, I, no, I wanted to do that. 
And um, I think that has held me at times when I haven't wanted to obey. <laughs> and uh, we've, we, we rarely fight, <laughs> Terry and I, but there have been times when we... <laughs> <laughs> start now. <laughs> there have been times when we've really had to tussle something through, but I've been very conscious that in the end, um, th t Terry makes the decision in the end if, if, if there is a, a controversial issue. And... Uh, and I have been glad that he has, he is the leader in our marriage. And I would unashamedly say that, and I would say that is biblical. And I do believe in, um, well, just reading in 1 Corinthians 11 yesterday, uh, where it talk, um, we, I better not go there because I might start preaching. But um, <laughs> there, there, is, uh, there is an order, a godly order, and uh, right from Genesis right through, God put order in the universe, makes things work. I mean, you've got tides, you've got the moon, you've got you know, seasons, you've got all of these things, and God has put boundaries in place. And, and then it says, and then he, God made the man and the woman, the man and the woman he made, and then he gave them a, a, a job to do, and he gave them an order to keep. And um, if you keep walking God's way, you find that life is less complicated and I think life is incredibly complicated these days. And uh, largely because people have abandoned God's order. And it makes life very, very confusing. And um, I think through our 50 years of marriage, um, we have been clear about that, haven't we? That Terry, uh, I'm, I'm not a doormat, and, uh, um, but I do believe in him being my head. And uh, I'm, I'm unashamed about that. In fact, I'm proud to have a man who can be my head, who I can respect, who, uh, who can speak God's life and word into me. He doesn't squash me, he leads me. And I'm happy to follow that lead. And I think that that brings peace to us. It brings joy to us. I know what my place is. But um, I, I'm not squashed down. I'm not oppressed. I hope I don't come over as oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, relationships are something that God has invented. Uh, husband and wife, um, mother, father, son, daughter, these are all avenues that God can manifest himself. And I think it's very sad when families are fragmented because it closes off ways in which God can show himself. I think... Um, for example, that a husband and a wife can show something, make it easier for people to see something of God. I think a godly mother manifests something of God. A godly father manifests certain ways in which God operates. I think godly brothers and sisters also manifest or, or give opportunity for God to manifest himself through those unique relationships. So when those relationships are not functioning, it closes down ways in which God can show himself. So I believe a godly family in a neighborhood can be very powerful. My own son and his wife, um, one of my sons, my eldest son, Ben, he and his wife live on a neighborhood in London, which is a Bangladeshi Muslim community. They're all Bangladeshi Muslims. And... Uh, Somehow or other, he found himself on that, that estate with his six children. Now, it's, it's, uh, the way the houses are, they, it's very obvious what people are doing. That behind the houses, it's just all open. And, uh, and so they, they will sit in the garden outside, in their yard outside. They will eat there. They, will, they have a big trampoline. They are just an open family. And all of those Muslim people watch them. Now, they've been there 10 years, and it was very difficult at first for uh, them to make relationships, but they've become trusted in that Muslim community, and they've made friends. And now, whenever I go, their front door is open. There's kids running in and out. Uh, ben is helping them mend their bikes. They're borrowing balls. Um, women are coming in and out with food. My daughter-in-law, she reads the Quran alongside the Bible with three other women on the on the, that estate, seeking to bring them to Jesus. And uh, they, they're just being a family for Jesus is powerful. Yeah. 
And so I am passionate about Christian family life. And I advocate a real family has fathers and mothers. And if it's not in the natural, it's got to be in the spiritual. The, the church is the family of God. And so when people get born again into that family, they come into an atmosphere, an environment where there should be fatherhood and motherhood, brotherhood and sisterhood. Paul speaks in, in the epistles, I think it's in Titus, he says that young men look, um, regard the, the young women amongst you as sisters. And he talks um, in, I think it's in Romans 16, he says, so-and-so has been a mother to me. Paul says that that some of the older women in the church have been like mothers to him. And so all those relationships should be shown in the church. And that's where we find peace, we find training, we find nurture, we find, um, we, we, we find a refuge when we're hurt. That's the, the, the church should be a manifestation of the family of God. So um, I think our, when you come back to our marriage, we began with that, but it gets wider and wider. <laughs> And, and that a marriage like that and a ministry that goes along with it doesn't just happen um, overnight. These aren't things that just oh, do it to this God's gifting. Can, can you guys talk us through practically your, your devotional life, your walk with Christ? What does it look like? How do you read the Bible? How do you open the scriptures every day? And what's that journey look like for you in your prayer life? Um, if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I think that as we talk about this weekend uh, a lot, I believe in the grace of God. And I think so often uh, people talk about prayer and Bible reading as the means of grace, but very often they come over as the rules you have to keep, yeah. the thing you have to do. And I'm hoping that when I'm preaching this weekend, I can lift the lid off that and, and show the difference between legalism and grace, because it really is a big thing, a huge thing yeah. to set the, set the people free, yeah. that we're not under law, we're under grace. Yeah. I mean, it's wonderful. But to have to distinguish between legalism and discipline, which again I hope I can deal with uh, over the weekend. Uh, legalism is trying to gain merit, is trying to impress God, maybe impress other people, trying to prove yourself through rule keeping. Discipline is something quite different. It's something you choose to maintain for your own good. And so I, in terms of prayer, I, I choose to be disciplined, not to impress God, I am hidden in someone who's already impressed God. Hallelujah. I mean, I'm, I'm hidden in Jesus, and the Father thinks he is amazing, and I'm hidden in him. Hallelujah. So I don't have to impress God. Jesus did it for me, and it frees me completely. Praise the Lord. We'll talk a lot about that at the weekend. And it's important that people grasp it because it comes like revelation. Oh, my word, I'm free. And uh, when you know you're free, when you pick up discipline, you don't do it to get under a heavy burden again. You just find it useful. And so for myself, I, I'm pretty disciplined. Um, and uh, so, but I, as I say, it's not legalism. But uh, Bible reading, I think it's good to keep changing, uh, to keep it fresh the way you do it. So, uh, you know, we know the Bible's full of truth. We know it's... Uh, it's full of encouragement, inspiration. We can meet with God there. Uh, how we do that, um, I, I've tried all sorts of different ways over the years. With, uh, I, I went, when I was a young Christian, on what they called a Bible meditation course, which helped me to kind of get under the skin of the passage, find sometimes a phrase or a word or a thought, follow it through a concordance, just, and I'd always have a notebook and, and you know, might get a phrase like trust in the Lord or something and just follow it through the scripture and, and just let it speak to me that day and the next day it might be something else, um, meditating on a particular little thing. And I, I did that probably for years. And then after a while I thought, do you know, I, I haven't read the whole Bible through for a long time. I've almost forgotten the story of David, you know. And, uh, and so I heard of the Murray McShane Bible reading plan, uh, read the whole Bible through uh, in a year. And so I thought, well, I think I'll do that for a change, you know, to change, to come at it freshly. So I did, I did that for a year. So to read the whole Bible through in a year, I found it very unsatisfactory because I'm, I'm not digging under the surface and you have to keep reading to keep through this. You've got to get, read four passages a day. It's hard work. And at the end of the year, I thought, do you know, actually, I'm beginning to enjoy this. 
and I did it another year. I did it for five years. I just kept going, kept going. And I began to find that very enjoyable. Then after about five years, I thought, hmm, I think I'm going to approach it a different way. I think I'm going to use a, com I'm going to use a com um, commentary. And so I started with Matthias commentary on Isaiah. I'd never worked through a commentary in my devotional reading before. I loved it. I thought, wow, this is so exciting. His insights into Isaiah, I never understood Isaiah like that before. And so I, I've used all kinds of approaches. And at the moment, I'm using a mixture of working through a commentary and doing McShane over two years, not one year. So um, if I do it over one year, you've got so much reading to do. Over two years, it's not quite so demanding. I just have to read two chapters a day. I read the difference. When you're reading through, you haven't got time to meditate. You're just letting, but I'm getting a quick view of the whole Bible every year. I'm going through the Bible again and again and again. And um, at the same time, uh, I'm working through Second uh, Chronicles, uh, Second Corinthians, verse by verse by verse with a commentary. So I'm, I find approaching the Bible, uh, keep changing my approach to keep it fresh, trying to get under the skin of it, looking to see what God will say to me. I'm usually writing something down uh, so that I'm getting something from the page. So yeah, that's the way uh, I, would, I would be in the Bible uh, on that regular basis. I'm also uh, reading other books from time to time as well, maybe a, a book on a particular subject or a theme. I'm reading a book on adoption uh, while we're away. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. A book on adoption, uh, and I, you know, I, I'll pick up other books on, uh, I mean, biblical Christian adoption. Um, so, you know, different themes. I'm always reading different themes. I read a book on the crucifixion last year, wonderful book. And so, you can enlarge by reading other stuff as well, but getting into the Bible is fundamental and helpful and keeps feeding me. Um, and prayer, you know, we could talk for hours about prayer that I need to be with God. And uh, when I first started, when I left secular work a long time ago, I felt God called me to do evangelism and to pray. And uh, I, I, I started going from house to house uh, sharing the gospel. And I was terrible at it. I was really awful. I was the worst door-to-door -door evangelist that ever walked the planet. And uh, the place I went, the Jehovah's Witnesses had already been, and the Mormons had put a house. So I'm number three at the front door. Uh, I was like, go away, go away. And I was useless. I was terrible. And uh, I remember I, I felt God spoke to me and said, your first calling is to be a worshiper. That's your first call. Uh, John's Gospel, chapter 4, God is seeking worshippers. And I, and I felt God rescued me from my desperation about how terrible I was at door-to-door -door evangelism. And so, no, your first call, your, your raison d'etre, the reason you're on the planet, you're a worshipper. It's your number one calling. You're a worshipper. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is a bonus. I want a worshipper in you. So, for me, uh, prayer begins with worship. And uh, as I've grown older and been around longer, my period, you know, whatever lo length of time I'm in prayer, more and more of it is worship. Uh, and it's thanksgiving. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Get taken up with God. I sing a lot. In my, 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 my sister led me to Christ. She said, you must have a quiet time. I thought, what a quaint phrase. What's a quiet time? Uh, but I have a fairly noisy time, and I sing a lot. And I sing in the Spirit, and I sing uh, songs that we know. I have a hymn book handy. I've got actually four hymn books on my desk. And, and sometimes an old hymn comes to mind. I can't remember it all. I pick out the hymn book. And, I, and sometimes a hymn will take you in a journey. A lot of hymns, like four or five verses, they take you on a journey, and uh, I just find it so edifying. Really good hymns uh, take me on where I wasn't going to go, uh, and they open up things about Jesus and excite me about Jesus. So I sing songs that we all know. Uh, I sing songs from old hymn books. I just sing and worship. I sing in the Spirit. I get into the presence of God. I, 
we are all a temple of the Holy Spirit. So for me, prayer is enjoying that reality. I'm worshiping, I'm enjoying Jesus on a daily basis. And then, yeah, of course, we pray, we ask for things. And uh, we're looking for God to uh, answer prayer. He's made some incredible promises. He said, call unto me, I'll answer you. And, uh, you know, John 15, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and bring forth fruit. Whatever you ask the Father in my name. So I come to God and say, Lord, I didn't choose you. You chose me. You appointed me to ask. Here I come. I'm a God-appointed asker. I'm asking for this. I'm asking for this. And so, yeah, we ask for things. We ask for things. And Wendy and I, when we first started, I, I probably got to know Wendy in a, in a prayer meeting, uh, which is a great place to meet. Uh, when we were at Bible college, the, my my roommate was the first guy I laid hands on to receive the Spirit at Bible College. And then we started praying together on a Sunday afternoon. And then that prayer meeting just grew and grew and grew and grew. And then Wendy joined that prayer meeting. So we got to know one another probably in a prayer meeting more than anywhere else at first. And, uh, and then when we got married, and we're in this together. Uh, and we, we, we go to a church that, you know, they're warm, they want us, but we want something more than there's there. So, when is my chief prayer partner? And we're praying and praying, and, and sometimes we fast and pray for a lunchtime, like, let's pray for that couple next. I think they look, they look really open to God. Let's go for them. Let's pray. Let's pray for them. And then we say, have you read this? You know, you might like to think about it. And then we pray for them, ask them around for a meal. Who should we go for next? And if we're on an adventure together, we want to get this church through. We're after couples. We're after people. We want to get this church through. And we were in that together. And then, and then as time goes by, uh, babies come along and elders come along. And, uh, and, and, and your center of gravity changes a bit. And, and I think you've got to be aware there are seasons. There are seasons. And we had five kids. And, uh, and, and there are seasons when babies make huge demands. And, uh, and so we have to be careful. And I think sometimes because our enemy is called the accuser of the brothers and sisters who accuses us day and night as his chief weapon to accuse. Sometimes we, we, when prayer doesn't work or I'm sleepy or it didn't work, that's where we can get buffeted. And I think sometimes wives feel that more than anybody. I'm not able to keep it up. Well, you know, you've just lost your sleep through the night again. The baby was crying, was sick and so on. And, and you've, got to un, you've got to be sensitive to seasons. And so for Wendy and me, yeah, we've always prayed together. But now that we've empty nesters, as they say in America, all our kids have flown. We're, we pray together a lot again. Uh, we, we know virtually daily, not necessarily daily, but virtually daily, we're fighting in prayer together again. We're crying to God for our kids, our grandkids, the church we're involved with, uh, the teams that we've sent out. Well, I love praying with Wendy. We pray together a lot again. There are seasons where it wasn't quite so much because, well, there's huge demands. And, uh, but we've never lost it, but it's back as a main, a big, big part of our lives together now. So we've never thrown it away, but to be sensitive to and be aware of the huge demands that are on married life, little children, etc. And so we never want to get under law. Yeah. We don't become legalistic. We think, oh gosh, you know what? No, 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 we never go there. We don't need to, hallelujah. Yeah. But disciplines are helpful, and, uh, and to pray things through, to believe God Amen. together. Uh, yeah, it's a huge theme.